So uh, good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are. Uh, I know some of us, uh, for some of us, uh, especially our presenters, uh, it's uh, just just the morning. Um, but uh, this is the first uh, session of, of our second series this year with the AIA Philly Coat uh, 2030 Working Group. We started um, we started this back in uh, at the end of 2019 as an in-person uh, local Philadelphia uh, meeting, uh, at rotating different uh, offices. Um, and then in March 20, uh, we uh, this this one all went uh, virtual. And uh, as as things have started going virtual, so so has our uh, our working group and lecture series. Uh, our, our working group series uh, evolved. So um, it, it we transitioned to Zoom and uh, and uh, the uh, virtual meeting platforms. And and I guess as of April of of 20 um, and. Uh, we have been able to uh, kind of involve uh, people from around the country, experts, uh, uh, folks we, we know. And over the last uh, couple of years, we've covered uh, a number of, of topics. Um, and basically in 2030, uh, sorry, in 2020, um, you know, going through kind of, uh, you know, general larger topics, energy modeling, um, net zero buildings, kind of the big picture topics. Then in 2021, um, we actually had quite an aggressive schedule. We went through uh, really almost 12 different topics in 12 months um, and just, just various aspects uh, in support of the, you know, the goal of, of carbon neutrality and sustainability uh, in our work. Um, and then uh, this year, um, so I'm trying to advance my slide. Uh, so this year, um, we decided to kind of regroup and uh, put together a couple of series of presentations. Uh, we, we completed the first one this spring, uh, focused on kind of going back to the beginning and setting sustainability goals and, and the process for doing that, uh, both uh, on projects and as, as a firm. We had an initial presentation similar to this one, and then we followed it up with, uh, with two workshops, uh, much like uh, this Embodied Carbon series uh, will work. So this is the first, first presentation and uh, we have a, a great group of, uh, of, of experts who will, who will introduce uh, in a moment. Sorry, I'll turn off these notifications. Um, so just, to, just as a kind of a reminder for, for everyone, we started this uh, to really support the, the 2030 uh, commitment effort. Um, you know, obviously a very important initiative getting towards carbon neutral by, by the year 2030. And I think um, in rele rele relevant to today's topic, um, embodied carbon is really an emerging um, aspect of that. And uh, one that we're you know, seeing the, uh, the AI 2030 commitments start to engage, but one that also we're seeing across the profession, uh, embodied carbon is a topic that's of great interest um, you know, with, within firms and across firms. So just a reminder, um, it, joining the 2030 commitment uh, is, is actually uh, quite, quite easy. There's a lot of myths about it being equivalent to lead, but it does not take long to report your work. Um, it's actually very productive and useful to, to report your work um, in terms of getting feedback about, about your, about your uh, progress. And as we've, as we've mentioned before, um, there's just really a couple of steps to getting started, uh, writing a commitment letter, then developing a, a sustainability action plan, which is uh, what we focused on at the beginning of this year, kind of revisiting uh, what, you know, how that process can work. And then really the, the value that I was just speaking of in reporting your projects and understanding your performance, then gives you, you know, great uh, insight into where you're, where you need to go and where and, and how to move. And, um, and, and, get, and that feedback can then be fed, fed into your next projects, your ne the next phases of your current projects. And, and really this uh, reporting should be an ongoing um, process, ideally in your work. So uh, just a couple of logistical notes before we get started. Um, I think Jonky has shared the, uh, in the chat, the link to uh, sign in, register, provide your AIA number, and get your your CEU credits. Um, also, questions as we go, uh, please drop them in the chat, and we will um, either pick them up as we go or pick, uh, 
uh, catch up on them at the end in our, our Q&A. And also just so everybody is aware, we are recording. Uh, we do uh, make these sessions available after the fact, which is I think also very useful uh, to, uh, to kind of see these presentations in case you missed one. And then you can see our AI affiliate code page on uh, YouTube. You can uh, pretty much get there by searching AI affiliate code and on YouTube and, and that'll take you there. But that link is uh, provided here. So today um, we are starting off this series uh, on, on embodied carbon uh, with a, a presentation on carbon accounting for facade design. And our learning objectives, just to, to paraphrase, to identify factors that contribute to embodied carbon in facade design, uh, opportunities for reducing embodied carbon, um, and uh, explaining appropriate levels uh, for different phases of the design. And part of our presentation will be on on the integration into the design process. And also, um, you know, some, some thoughts on how to evaluate tools for tracking embodied carbon. There are numerous tools out there, as, as many of you probably know, and, um, and provide some thoughts on that. So as, as I mentioned, we uh, are able to, um, through the magic of Zoom, get uh, bring, bring together, uh, you know, uh, geographically, uh, you know, diverse uh, pre presenters around the around the country, um, and uh, we have uh, Avery Escott from uh, Karen Timberlake, who's going to set the table um, uh, today on, on the presentation with a, a, a start. Uh, Alex Ianchenko from uh, Miller Hall, who's going to present some some case studies, um, kind of following on the uh, the process that uh, that uh, that uh, Avery's going to present. And Vikram Sami from uh, Olson Kundig is also going to pick up. And uh, then we'll follow up with a, with a discussion um, at the end. I seem to be missing our agenda slide. Um, not sure what happened to that, but, uh, but again, uh, we will um, uh, be uh, starting with an intro from, from Ifri, and then uh, Alex will pick up with some case studies uh, and be followed by, uh, by Vikram. So with, without uh, further ado, I think we, I, I'm gonna stop sharing Avery and let you uh, pick up so you can uh, present uh, a little more smoothly. There we go. I think I just stole it from you, Josh. So okay. I think we're good. Yeah. Um, hi everybody, uh, Avery Escott with Kieran Timberlake. Um, most of you have probably heard me present on life cycle assessment or embodied carbon before. So we're gonna keep it real short. Um, but essentially, if you haven't, if you haven't heard about this topic or you haven't engaged with it deeply yet, if you've only heard one presentation about it and you can't remember what all the jargon means, uh, that's what we're going to try and cover really quickly before we hear uh, from Alex and Vikram on some amazing case studies. So um, Tally's really big on this slide because that's what most of you probably know me from. Uh, Kieran Timberlake made Tally in... Uh, we went officially public in 2014. Uh, we had lots of widespread beta tests in 2013. Um, so we've been talking about this stuff for a long time. Um, it is now owned by Building Transparency, which is a great nonprofit that also runs the EC3 tool. So let's talk about embodied carbon. Um, building is an infrastructure account for nearly 40% of all global carbon emissions. Um, this is something that at this point should feel very familiar. Um, and equally familiar for everyone on this call who is AIA and trying to get those CEUs, feel free to fill it out at Google in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, we have an ethical responsibility. It is a part of our code of ethics at this point to address carbon and climate change on every single one of our projects. So uh, luckily there is now a very widespread coalition of folks working on this topic. Um, this is just a handful of them. There are more, um, I'm realizing that uh, I'm missing at least six that I know of that have started up since I originally made this slide um, last year. So it is a growing uh, coalition and whatever your area of focus is in design and in the delivery of buildings, there is probably a group out there that can specifically support you in reducing the carbon emissions associated uh, with your part of the work. Um, these are the primary players in terms of uh, structure and architectural scope. Uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, the words that we're going to be using relatively interchangeably um, would be something like GWP, which stands for Global Warming Potential, and Carbon, 
um, which is shorthand for uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent, um, or you know, CO2. Um, the reason that we do that is because there are lots of gases that contribute to climate change and global warming, um, carbon dioxide being one of them, methane being another one. Um, you might have heard about the recent realization that our methane leaks are not um, as under control as we thought they were. Um, and the thing is, is we, we calculate a way to consolidate all of those into a single metric for tracking purposes and to be able to do a little bit of comparison between how bad is this versus how bad is that? And if I tell you that you're emitting 15 tons of methane and 62 tons of carbon dioxide, that's really hard to calculate and compare against each other. Whereas we can just say carbon um, as one unit, it's a little bit easier. Um, so we do do that translation, understanding that yes, there are some differences in terms of how long they linger in the atmosphere. And I am happy to get super nerdy about all of that at some point off the call if anybody wants to reach out. Um, Anybody want to get into the debate about fossil fuel, carbon versus biogenic carbon, I am here for it. All right, um, for everybody else, uh, the biggest reason why we're talking about this today is that 40% of global emissions, half of it associated with new construction is going to be associated with the embodied carbon. Um, and so that's why this topic is super important. That's why what Alex and Vikram are going to be showing you is really vital to be starting to work into your own practice. So um, business as usual, this is kind of what it looks like, right? Your operational carbon is continuing to emit. Hopefully it's not gonna be linear. Hopefully our grid gets greener and that starts to taper off. Um, but essentially when we talk about upfront carbon or the carbon that is emitted at the first day that you are occupying your building, we're talking about the carbon that is mostly associated with embodied carbon um, and the carbon associated with the manufacturing, the transportation and the construction processes. So the good news is that we are targeting that operational carbon um, really, really well as an industry. And this working group has had uh, a lot of meetings about that topic, helping you get there. Um, but as we get better and better and better about our operational carbon emissions, that embodied carbon becomes a bigger and bigger part of our carbon footprint. And that's why we need to start focusing on it as well. So what do I mean when I use the term embodied carbon? I mean all of the carbon emissions that are associated with everything that goes into our buildings. The, um, from the point of extraction to smelting of metals, mining, all the transportation that goes into it. And we have some specific terms that we use for these. You'll see, um, essentially, this is the life cycle of a mullion. You know, first it has to be mined, the ore gets mined, then it gets smelted, then it gets extruded, then it actually gets used in the building, then at some point the building gets demolished, and at some point, you know, hopefully that gets reclaimed, reprocessed, maybe recycled, um, and then lots and lots of transportation in between every single one of these steps. In life cycle assessment, we simplify that um, by calling it module A for manufacturing and construction. Module B is the use phase when the building's actually occupied. Um, module C is the end of life, what happens when you're done with the building. Um, and then module D is this extra thing that doesn't really fall on a timeline, but has to do with credits and also impacts associated with things like reuse or recovery or recycling. LCA is the modeling method that evaluates the inputs, outputs, and the potential impacts of that entire life cycle um, across multiple areas of environmental impact. Embodied carbon um, is one of them um, and usually is talked about as global warming potential. An embodied carbon calculator, something like EC3, um, is a tool that can quickly sum up the upfront carbon um, or the carbon that's emitted before um, the building is occupied typically, associated with the carbon emissions uh, that are, come from a product system, assembly, or a material. So the big difference here is LCA is a global term um, life cycle assessment being something that measures a bunch of different environmental impacts and can flex across the whole lifespan of a product. And a body carbon calculator is usually something that's just focusing on carbon and is typically um, something that is uh, looking just at that manufacturing construction phase. So we've got tools that support this that are made specifically for the built environment, Tally being one of them. I talked briefly about that. You can hear me talk about it a whole lot in a lot of recorded uh, webinars and lectures that are available online. There are some other great whole building LCA tools as well. Um, eTool and Athena being the two that um, 
I most strongly recommend. If you're not a Revit user, Tally only works with Revit. So um, if you're not in Revit, there are still tools for you. Um, and then there are some other great tools as well that are more of an embodied carbon calculator. Um, Kaleidoscope is some bundling of life cycle assessment work done by Payette. Um, presented in a really beautiful graphic format, allowing you to do some quick comparisons in early phase design. CGF has an embodied carbon calculator specifically for concrete, optimizing your concrete mixes. Uh, EHDD just finished releasing at uh, the conference last week, uh, the EPIC tool, um, which is an amazing tool for calculating your carbon uh, during early phase design, um, even in the BD process, to be able to do some rough order of magnitude calculations. Um, and then EC3, which I mentioned earlier, which is a tool for comparing EPDs against each other, and then also potentially calculating uh, some of the upfront carbon associated with your building. So um, at KT, we've been doing this for a long time. That's why we developed Tally. Um, and we've started asking much more aggressive questions about things like, what would it take to hit zero in body carbon? Um, and it's net zero because uh, you're never going to be able, well, hopefully eventually we can find zero carbon glazing, but right now it's not something that's available. Um, and so you're looking at how different offsets and um, bio-based sequestering materials can balance against some of the carbon that's being emitted associated with your concrete or um, your glazing systems. These, that is one case study. We have a whole series of them that we've published to our issue page. Um, it's also located somewhere on our website, um, but our website I find very confusing, so I'm sure anyone else visiting does too. Um, so if you go straight to our issue page, you can see these case studies published there. Um, we've got four of them written up at this point, um, and we'll continue publishing them as we go. And then uh, on the Google Drive version of this PowerPoint jockey, uh, whoever is driving that side of things, there's also a slide that has all of those links and resources for you. So links to the issue page, links to all of the organizations listed on that slide, um, all the embodied carbon calculators and um, all of the LCA tools. So um, that's all there for you. And uh, hopefully you're able to dive in and start using it uh, there are things that are there for free, there are things that are there for small firms, there are things that are there for bigger firms. So it really is time for everybody to be getting in the game and working on this topic area. And now you're going to hear from Alex, uh, who's going to tell you a little bit about the amazing work that their firm has been doing um, in terms of this topic. Oh, and also, um, if you're interested in getting to know more about this, uh, there are some amazing uh, tutorials and information um, from the Carbon Leadership Forum uh, in Seattle and in Vancouver um, that give you some introduction to this topic area and then also some really deep dives on um, a pretty advanced technical level uh, if you're at that point uh, on some specific material case studies. So uh, Alex, you're right. Thanks, E3. Um, yeah. Thanks to everyone. It's good to be in virtual Philadelphia. Um, thanks for inviting me to be here. So I am going to talk about how to integrate all of the great stuff that Ifri just talked about into project delivery, also known as how can we get this done. So the good news is, is that there's something to do for every phase of design, from pre-design to construction administration, the world of embodied carbon tasks abounds. And as Ifri mentioned, there are lots of tools to help you along the way. Uh, so along the bottom of the screen, what you're seeing is how our firm, Miller Hull, based in Seattle and in San Diego, um, when we activate the use of which tool. We use Tally during schematic design up to construction documents. We then supplement it with EC3. So right now, I'm just going to go through each phase one by one and talk about some of the tasks and actions that are key for the delivery of uh, low embodied carbon projects. In pre-design, the very first thing to do is, of course, to understand your client goals and to designate staff and time. I bolded that item on the left green box uh, for a reason, because we learned after about three years of trying to get life cycle assessment to take at Miller Hull that really we needed project managers to incorporate the appropriate time for life cycle assessment into their planning. So to that, to that end, now our project plans include built-in time for embodied carbon studies at various stages of design. The next step that's written on there is to perform a gap analysis. 
This is something that we do at Miller Hull uh, that is similar to the EPIC tool that Ephraim mentioned. It's trying to forecast the overall carbon picture of the design as early as possible in order to then establish reduction goals with the team. A couple of um, kind of sub points that we found to be important in pre-design is uh, to, first of all, identify who's responsible for which scopes of the work. Life cycle assessment is not necessarily all one big task. There will be lots of little subtasks that belong to it. So for example, cleaning up the Revit model or putting together a slide deck for a client presentation. It's important to delineate who is actually doing what, uh, as well as fit the analysis into the schedule. We've also started writing tally modeling into our BIM execution plans. So if uh, some of you may be familiar with larger institutional projects that have a dedicated BIM execution plan, which delineates the roles of, of every party, every consultant uh, when they model, um, writing tally into that plan early helps us communicate with the rest of our consultants and, and have a really high powered team. But at this point, we also have more kind of design, design minded things that could be going on. Um, specifically, uh, site and structure are two carbon related topics that you can start thinking about basically as soon as you have the pursuit. Um, how will the site and the soils affect the structure requirements? How can you build as lean as and as little as possible? Doing some rule of thumb studies on structural material options, um, as well as considering the possibility for material reuse from the existing structures on site. Um, so both in terms of project management and team strategy and design when it comes to site and structure, these large tasks set the course for the rest of the design process. So during schematic design, as the project is getting more specific, uh, this would be a time when we can start using tally. One strategy that we found effective at Miller Hole is to set up a decision log for tracking. What we mean by that is we need to basically have internal knowledge of the team of the decisions that were made that have a carbon outcome. Oftentimes we make decisions about design and we don't necessarily record them or study them or quantify them. That's okay. What's important is that those decisions are still documented. And an example would be um, say, reprogramming some of your space to extend the building in, uh, in into another wing, or it could be, you know, looking at a different roof form these are things that don't necessarily have to be quantified at this time, but as long as we're thinking about carbon and we're tracking these decisions for later, it helps backtrack and, and finally quantify the uh, impact of the design product with the baseline case. Identifying material reuse strategies. Uh, I mentioned this in pre-design as well, but uh, for some projects, schematic design is a better time to start looking at exactly which materials on site can be salvaged and how. Analyzing structural options uh, and analyzing envelope options are two tasks that I sort of see bundled together. Um, at this stage, many of the teams that I work with are not necessarily in Revit yet. Some are in Rhino, others are still doing hand sketches, others might be moving into Revit land. But that shouldn't preclude you from running life cycle assessment studies. We don't need to run a study of the entire building. Um, but looking at something like a structural bay or a single swatch of wall and comparing it to other swatches of wall is a pretty quick thing to do, and it can help set the course for the entire design moving forward. In fact, most of the case studies that I'm going to share today were produced during schematic design as we were analyzing envelope options for uh, various projects. When it comes to design questions that are particularly salient during schematic design, uh, looking at massing, how is the massing affecting the structure? Looking at transparency and opacity in the facade, uh, I've, I will allude to this later during the schematic, uh, during the case study portion of the presentation, but there is a balancing act to play between energy performance, daylight performance, and carbon performance when as early as setting window to wall ratios will have an effect on all three of those things. And finally, looking at solar shading strategies in the building orientation is whatever the building orientation currently forcing us to build more. 
I like to think of this third point as um, kind of like, are we fighting against the site? Does the site require us to use more materials to achieve the same level of occupant comfort, structural safety, um, et cetera? Design development, however, uh, this is where we can finally get out of, uh, you know, this is where we, we can really run whole building life cycle assessments and start looking at the whole picture. Um, I really like this part. This is the part that I'm most excited about because it finally puts all of the carbon impacts that you've discussed during pre-design and schematic design in context. So uh, identifying the hotspots in the design, what really does carry the most impact across the entire board. And once you've identified those hotspots, uh, the next task is to optimize those assemblies and finishes that you've pulled out. Another uh, very important part that I'm working through right now is developing specifications. Usually um, we're trying out a few new things when it comes to specifications, uh, definitely trying to collect EPDs across all projects consistently. But some of our projects are actually starting to set uh, embodied carbon limits for various uh, materials like concrete or rebar if we deem it to be possible within the market conditions of the project. This is a conversation that is pretty complicated and it usually will involve your contractor, your, your subs, as well as a, a pretty good understanding of what the local market can produce and whether that meets the client's requirements. But this conversation, even though it's not really happening on the design, you know, on in the design drawing space, it's just as important in order to deliver low embodied carbon projects. As well as uh, together with the specifications and that collaboration that you're starting with your GC, speaking about actually the type of materials you'd like to procure, Another important task to start getting into design development is to plan for the procurement of those low embodied carbon materials. Uh, of course, our GCs are also a great resource to help us understand the constraints of the market, the constraints of scheduling, and whether the materials that we really specify are available. Um, it's best to know that ahead of time. So for example, if you, know, if you don't have fly ash in your area, you probably shouldn't be putting that into your specs. In any case, design development is uh, a, a phase where finally a more holistic picture of whole building life cycle assessment can emerge and help guide construction documents. So during construction documents, this is uh, just like with design, which is focused on documentation at this point, life cycle assessment also kicks into documentation mode. During construction documents, we can run another whole building life, building life cycle assessment to document the design decisions that were made. Remember setting up the decision log? This is where it gets wrapped up and we finally come to terms with what were the decisions that were made by the design team and the carbon outcomes of those decisions, as well as putting a bow to the specifications and the procurement plan. Finally, construction administration. Uh, another embodied carbon task that's on your plate during this time is to look at substitution requests. Right now, Miller Hall is looking at how to revise our substitution request form in such a way that it's still, you know, usable, uh, but it helps us to better track whether the products that are being installed on site are the ones that we actually anticipated to install and how that fits into the overall carbon story of the project. This is also a chance to collect EPDs when you have a real project and a real GC and a real sub that's going out to real manufacturers and asking for EPDs. That's a lot more powerful than just doing some like Googling on the side and trying to contact manufacturers about it. And finally, documenting lessons learned. So that takes us through the kind of integrating embodied carbon into design through uh, all stages. By any means, this roadmap is not comprehensive. It's just what we've been using as sort of like a working tool at Miller Hall to try and keep our, you know, story straight on what when it comes to what we do and why and when. So with that, I'm now going to go into some case studies of facade related studies that uh, we've completed at Miller Hall. And the first case study tries to answer this question. What is the most carbon efficient opaque facade assembly? This is a case study that was started, I wanna say about two or three years ago. Uh, and the building I will be referencing this to is the Health Science Education Building, which is located in Seattle, Washington. 
And as much as I would love to take credit for the beautiful graphics in this section, I do have to, uh, you know, step aside and give credit where credit is due. Most of these are uh, were done by the Health Science Education Building Design and Construction team. I was not part of that team. I was doing some data research on the side. But uh, what you're looking at is a hundred thousand square foot building. It's four stories above grade, one story below grade. It's located in that ostentiously marked yellow square in the middle of the screen. So what you're seeing right now is the University of Washington campus, uh, right north of that uh, yellow squ square. Uh, over to the left is Interstate 5, crossing over the large body of water that's Portage Bay towards the bottom and Lake Union towards the, east, uh, towards the west of the page. So the Health Science Education Building is nestled into a really tight site. There's already uh, multiple buildings around that area that serve in particular the University of Washington Medicine, Nursing and Pharmacy Schools. And the aspiration of the Health Science Education Building is to serve exactly those programs. So dentistry, uh, nursing, medicine, pharmacy, public health and social work are all departments that share this building and uh, are hoping to use it for things like education, labs, community events, and outreach. So this is a uh, part of the vision of uh, some of the spaces that health sciences education building would be used for. A central narrative to this, pro to this project was the idea of the culture of care, how all of those faculties that would be using this space really have to center their narratives around caring for others and um, how to do that best. So this is an example of a multi, multifunctional kind of uh, informal study space. And below grade, we have uh, much more formal spaces. This is an anatomy lab, which uh, by the way, has like crazy ventilation requirements as it should. So, um, and this is what the health sciences building looked like at the beginning of this year. So what you're seeing is the CLT steel system. It's a hybrid structural system above grade. We have steel beams that are carrying our loads and then CLT decks. Uh, spanning between those steel beams. Overall, uh, the hybrid system went up really, really quickly, uh, which was a pleasant surprise, <laughs> both to uh, our design team and our partners, Lise Crutcher Lewis. So uh, if anyone wants to connect with me on the subject of CLT constructability, please do. But we are here to talk about facades. And the facade on this building is uh, just as interesting. So. This is kind of an early design sketch of the Health Science Education Building's facade scheme. Over on the left, you're seeing the south elevation and then the east elevation and the north elevation. So overall, you can, you can tell that there's sort of like two different systems going on. There's a podium and then there's a system above that podium. The system above the podium is what I'm gonna refer to as kind of the primary facade system. The primary facade system is clad in these corrugated metal shingles. Uh, these corrugated metal shingles was something that the, the design team really wanted in order to have an interplay of uh, light and then a sort of wrapping effect around the building. And the bottom portion of the facade scheme I'm going to refer to as the podium. So the podium portion uh, is uh, meant to, it, it's, it's the street level, it's the streetscape portion of the facade, and it contains both curtain wall and uh, GFRC panels. So this is, uh, er, this is last year, as the facade systems were coming together. What you're seeing on the top of the image is that primary shingle system on uh, steel rails. And at the bottom, the sheathing to accept the GFR Join the meeting on the podium portion. And, uh, yeah, but yeah. when it comes to embodied carbon, what we had a chance to study were those podium opaque uh, assemblies that you see highlighted on your screen with an arrow. So uh, essentially during design development, the team had multiple, uh, options developed for this opaque portion of the facade. 
and uh, was also concurrently going through a value engineering effort. So we really wanted to both understand carbon savings and cost savings concurrently in order to see if we could you know, find some sort of synergy and then use that to procure the lowest embodied carbon option. But the scope of this investigation is mostly focusing on this op these opaque areas around uh, the ground and level one floors of the building. Um, in terms of architectural expression, it was important to select something that really matched the designer's intent for the entryway sequence into the building. This is the street facing facade, um, and it would be the first thing that someone sees when they, you know, enter into the health sciences education building. So what we did uh, is we developed a series of design option studies using Tally. There were a couple of sketching sessions to figure out what the alternative wall assemblies really could be. Then each of those assemblies was modeled in Revit separately. It was just like a little swatch of one square meter of wall. Wall one is a concrete option that includes, uh, it's a cast in place option with a drainage mat and some XPS rigid insulation behind it to support. The idea behind this wall was that it could continue serving us at uh, below grade. Wall six is a fiber cement option. So this is looking at a jip wall board on the inside, then metal framing with that, a structure, a uh, jip again, mineral wool insulation, metal cladding support system like aluminum rails, and then fiber, fiber cement panels on top of that. Wall seven, was our precast option. It was very similar to wall six, except for looking at a precast concrete panel, either one inch thick or two inches thick. <clears throat> and finally, wall eight, looking at a corrugated metal panel, uh, similar to wall six and wall seven, but wall eight uh, was looking at a seven eighths of an inch corrugated metal siding on the exterior finish of this opaque wall. <coughs> Pardon. So the values that you're seeing at the bottom of the screen are the total global warming potential or GWP or total embodied carbon of each of those options, just when we were looking at them as swatches. So what we were really interested in wasn't so much the total value that you're seeing on the screen as the difference between those options. So this pretty much ruled out option one. <laughs> um, it clearly at, at you know, 10, thousand kilograms of CO2 equivalent. It by far outstripped all of our other options. But we also found that the corrugated metal panel was both best for the environment and best for cost on the project. So these same four wall assemblies were sent to our cost estimator at this time to try and understand what the VE potential would be for each one. And wall eight was a winner for both. So you might think, um, of course, Alex, you might have picked wall eight. That's not true. Unfortunately, uh, the team ended up going with wall six, which is, if you look at the embodied carbon numbers, it's the second, or, uh, yeah, se second, third best, second worst option that we had on here. So what happened? Well, uh, what happened is that embodied carbon does not always drive decisions when it comes to facade. Of course, there are lots of other um, factors that we're considering when we try to select the perfect expression. And in this case, I believe it was a combination of our architectural intent and scheduling <clears throat> that uh, kept us from getting that corrugated metal option that we wanted. <clears throat> but um, over in design development land, uh, once the project continued forward, we asked ourselves, well, where does the facade fall within the overall embodied carbon impact of the design? Once we were able to, you know, model those four swatches and compare them in terms of their impact against one another and make a design decision to move forward, we were finally at the stage to run a whole building life cycle assessment. And for health sciences, uh, what you're seeing are the top materials by global warming potential for the entire building. The red bars are representing total global warming potential over 60 years. The gray bars are representing the mass of each material in the building. And what you'll notice is that between the wide flange steel, the cast in place concrete, our XPS for under slab, or sorry, our XPS for undergrade, 
uh, insulation, some more concrete mixes, the HTPE, none of the top 10 are that opaque wall assembly that we just talked about. So again, this is, a, this is another harsh reality is that sometimes when you run these facade studies on a very limited extent of the entire facade, they are not huge embodied carbon moves. They're not the biggest bang for your embodied carbon buck. In this particular case, the structure essentially um, outstripped the facade by far. So what are some of the takeaways uh, from this case study and the question of what is the most carbon efficient opaque facade assembly? Um, this one's a little joke for LCA nerds. I wanted to <laughs> call one section results because that's like actually the answer to that question. And then co-products, which are things that we just happened to find out as we were running these studies. So the result of this facade study was that the metal panel option clearly outperformed the other three options, uh, likely because the other three options were cement based. And uh, we know that cement is one of the top contributors to embodied carbon in the building sector. We also saw that there is significant variability in the carbon between cast in place, precast and fiber cement panel options. But um, more importantly, some of the co-products that came out of the study, <coughs> excuse me, are that it was important to align value engineering with embodied carbon option studies even before the whole building life cycle assessment was possible. This meant that, you know, it, this went a long ways to integrating carbon into the design discussion of, uh, the, of, of the team. And we also learned that it's important to set constraints for an option study as concisely as possible. We need to understand if the options that we're developing are truly equally viable. So if we had the information about the kind of like intended architectural expression of this facade and that corrugated metal was not going to cut it, we probably wouldn't have studied it. So uh, setting constraints and very clear description for the function of each facade you're studying is important to make your, your study more useful. So with that, I'm going to move us into case study two. What is the most carbon efficient transparent facade composition? The image that you're seeing on the screen is the Blue Fin Building in London. It's not what we designed, but it is a representative image to uh, you know tease a little bit what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to focus on aluminum fins. Uh, the real project that this came out of uh, is unfortunately under NDA, and it is a government campus office building located in South Sudan. This is an image of South Sudan. It's a landscape that, uh, or this is an image particularly of a landscape, I believe, taken from Juba, the capital city. South Sudan is uh, one of the areas in the world that goes through, uh, instead of having like the four seasons, they have a wet season and then a dry season. The wet season can range anywhere from six to eight months and it's typically encompassing summer. Dry season happens during the winter. Uh, but over both seasons, it's a, it's a remarkably occupiable and habitable climate. Um, the lowest temperatures are in the 60s, the highest temperatures are in the 90s, so uh, pretty comfy. But uh, nevertheless, we were talking about different types of facade expressions for uh, this government office building in South Sudan. So early on during schematic design, uh, a similar exercise to what we just saw in health sciences, we developed a couple of options, just a little wall swatch between punched windows with a mass wall as, as an expression and a curtain wall as an expression. We also decided to look at the difference between having solar control and no solar control on both of those types of options. So this is the punched window, masked wall expression wall, then a little swatch of the same wall with steel outriggers in order to, and a light shelf in order to expand the wall and allow it to shade uh, the, the actual window and uh, create more occupant comfort on the inside. Here's the curtain wall without any solar control and the curtain wall option with appropriate solar control that would achieve the same type of occupant comfort for uh, the interior. Excuse me. <coughs> All right, can everyone still hear me? Yes. Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, let's get some carbon numbers. Here is the punched window mass wall compared to our punched window solar control. The solar control option, a little bit more impactful. The curtain wall without solar control was actually less impactful than its punched window counterpart. But then something happened with our solar controlled curtain wall. Its impact was almost double everything else. But really what we were looking for is to compare these two systems against one another, both with and without solar control. Without solar control, the curtain wall system outperformed the punched wall system by about 15%. However, when we did consider solar control in the mix, the opposite was true. The punched window system, the mass wall with steel outriggers actually ended up outperforming the curtain wall by almost 35%. So what happened? What happened is aluminum fins. <laughs> aluminum fins, it turns out, are intensely, they were, they were probably the most intense in terms of carbon to manufacture in that entire assembly. And uh, we are lucky that on the call, we have one of the co-authors of Aluminum and Life Cycle Thinking Towards Sustainable Cities, which is a report that Kieran Tim would like put out in 2015, looking at what is it about aluminum in the building sector and why is it so impactful? Uh, well, without like spoiling the report too much for you all, the answer is smelting, uh, because even though aluminum typically has a really high recyclability and is very valuable to recycle, it's very incentivized to recycle aluminum, and uh, a lot of pretty much all aluminum that we use in the building sector today has some measure of recycled aluminum in it. That doesn't mean that we we get to forego the impacts of smelting. All of that aluminum will still need to be re-smelted and recast and remanufactured to produce a final desirable aluminum product. And smelting is extremely energy intensive. In fact, uh, I looked up a couple of images of smelters because I don't, I've never been to one of these, um, but this is the Rusal Bratsk aluminum smelter. Looks pretty cool <laughs> architecturally. And this is an aluminum smelter over in Quebec. So these furnaces are typically uh, fired by, they, they are electric. So unlike steel furnaces that some of them require just coal or coke, aluminum smelters are electricity powered, but that electricity comes from different types of energy. So what powers aluminum smelters? Well, over time that mix has changed so in the graph over to the left, what you're seeing is uh, the power source for aluminum smelting from 1980 to 2010. The bottom bar is representing how much of the power is coming from hydro. You can see in the next field, the dark, uh, the light gray, that coal has been uh, you know, growing up and up in terms of uh, producing power for aluminum smelters. And the share of the overall power mix that goes to natural gas and nuclear and oil is, is pretty minuscule compared to coal and hydro. For reference, I, I pulled a couple of, uh, you know, power mix grids for uh, the United States, for Philadelphia and for Seattle. Both Philadelphia and Seattle are using a, proportionally about the same amount of hydro than like world primary aluminum smelting does. But aluminum smelting, in, around the world relies on coal much more heavily than either of our regions does. And um, as you'd imagine, global warming potential to produce a single aluminum window frame, or in our case, a single aluminum window fin, using different power sources for the smelter, the power sources have a big influence on the global warming potential that you come out with. Coal being about twice as impactful compared to the global average, hydro going into the negatives, by, uh, and then natural gas about the same as global average. So all this to say that with the second case study, when we started looking at what is the most carbon efficient transparent facade composition, the results that we got out of this is that, well, if we were just looking at embodied carbon, then the curtain wall without solar controls wins. 
but this is not really a real option to achieve occupant comfort simultaneously as carbon reductions. A punched window design can be less impactful than the same curtain wall, as long as we don't rely on those exterior aluminum fins that are driving so much of the impact. So the co-products of the study was to see that aluminum is a high carbon and a high value material and to use it sparingly. I really appreciate this finding because we weren't seeing this when we focused on the entire whole building life cycle assessment picture. When we look at whole building life cycle assessments, we often end up uh, kind of donating a lot of our time into uh, thinking about the steel and the concrete that belong to the structure of the building. But aluminum is a product that really dominates in, in the facade compositions uh, of, of the projects that we've designed recently. So this was a really important takeaway from actually putting together the numbers with you know, real world manufacturing processes. And another thing that was important uh, in this case is to run daylighting studies concurrently with our carbon studies. Uh, this is hard, and we have not done it for every project since, uh, but I, I do believe that we're moving towards a, a world where we, we're forced to run building energy and building an occupant comfort and embodied carbon sim simulation simultaneously in order to weigh those uh, different options against each other fairly. My last case study uh, it pertains just to finish. So we've talked about opaque systems and we've talked about transparent ones. This one is just gonna be that outer layer and uh, what to do about it. So uh, unfortunately, another project that uh, is anonymous, it is a research lab building in Southern California. In this case, the options that we were comparing were an EFIS system, a fiber cement system, stucco and terracotta. And uh, similar to the fir first case study where we started was modeling a swatch of each one of those buildings and comparing their 60 year global warming potential in Tally. If we look at the entire 60 years altogether, this is the story that Tally tells, the EFIS being the worst option, then fiber cement, then stucco, then terracotta. Terracotta being about 40% better than EFIS. But if we start drilling down, uh, the story changes. So this is the 60 year global warming potential of one square meter of each assembly broken out by life cycle stage. So every color is corresponding to a life cycle stage, just like Ifri presented at the beginning of our, of our session here, talking about A stage, B stage, C and D. You can see that uh, there are a couple of kind of like aberrations here. First of all, a really large green bar on terracotta. So that means that something in this assembly is taking a whole lot of credit for being recycled at the end of its life. And a really large red bar in EFIS, uh, that means that something in this assembly is not lasting the full 60 years and has to be replaced, or at least according to Tally, it does. So the conversation gets a little bit more nuanced. Um, what is it in EFIS that's not lasting the full duration? And what is it in terracotta that's giving it such a significant credit and such a significant bump into the negative direction. Because if we were to look at just the upfront embodied carbon emissions of each of these assemblies, the story is flipped. Suddenly it's terracotta that's doing the worst and EFIS that's performing the best. To drill down even further, uh, this is a graphic that breaks out the life cycle stage and each subcomponent of each of those four assemblies, EFIS, fiber cement, stucco, and terracotta. So this is helping us now to analyze what's really going on. First of all, that large red bar that I pointed out on the last slide, that's belonging to XPS. This is a modeling error. It's not real because no one would actually, you know, put take an EFIS panel apart in order to replace the XPS and then put it back together. So what we realized is that the life cycle that we had the XPS set to in our tally model was 50 years instead of 60. And that's what was kind of showing up as a big uh, as a as, as a big burden for this particular option. Galvanized steel. Uh, I wanted to point out that this is uh, this is a material that was virtually the same in impact across the fiber cement stucco and terracotta. Um, it's it, so we realized that it wasn't really serving us to include it in all of these options when really it was a wash. We still use the same amount of galvanized steel channels in order to hold up the final finish. 
And there's that really large green bar. It's aluminum. Again, <laughs> aluminum gets a huge recyclability credit, but should it? <coughs> so takeaways from the third case study. What is the best finish? In terms of upfront carbon expenditure, it's probably EFIS. In terms of lifetime impacts, it may be the terracotta panel. But the co-products of this investigation was to realize that when it comes to facades, durability is a major driver of lifetime global warming potential. And this investigation raises the question, which stages should we take credit for? Should we be looking at just upfront impacts that happen you know, before our global goal of curbing emissions by half in, by 2030? Or should we be looking at module D and taking credit for like a hypothetical recycling sometime in the future? It's a bigger question and probably another panel, um, but that wraps up the three case studies that I wanted to share with you all today. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Vikram who will give us even more case studies to think about. Thank you, Alex, that was amazing. And we have a bunch of questions that came in. We'll save those um, so that uh, Vikram has time to get into his case studies here. It's all yours, Vikram. Yeah, hi. Sorry, I think I was muted. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Ifri and Alex. Uh, you know, it's kind of a little daunting to go after those two uh, when it comes to talking about embodied carbon. So. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Vikram Sami. I'm the Director of Building Performance here at Olsen Kundig. And we're a 250-ish uh, person firm. We've got an, uh, our main office in Seattle. We have another office. We recently opened a second office in New York. And, oh, was my video not on? Oh. Yeah, um, and we have, uh, uh, you know, we have a practice that's pretty diverse, um, probably best known for our single family residences, but we, we do all kinds of uh, projects from, you know, um, resorts to uh, uh, mixed use office buildings and uh, other things. And we have recently be, uh, started to get more and more interested in understanding the impacts of uh, embodied carbon. We, we do a lot of uh, energy modeling and thinking about operational carbon in our offices. We have a small uh, analytical team in-house. Uh, and we've recently started to to uh, use Tally and sometimes EC3 to, to think about that. Um, so some internal efforts uh, that we've, uh, we've kind of been going through to improve our uh, awareness on thinking about uh, embodied carbon. Um, so a while back, we actually um, um, found this uh, article by Larry Strain on AIA's website on 10 steps to reduce. Is there a way to, can you guys see this little bar at the top of my screen? I'm not sure. Um, no, that's just you. Okay. Oh yeah, never mind. Um, and, um, you know, one of, it kind of made me think about like, you know, are we doing these things on our projects and are there ways in which we can, start to incorporate that. So I went back and look at, looked at those 10 steps and started to track like uh, different projects where we you know, we do a lot of uh, like adaptive reuse of existing buildings. Uh, finally, we actually didn't have too many projects that did the low concrete uh, specs. So that's something that we, we really wanted to, uh, uh, we're making an effort to look more, more deeply into. And then the other thing we, uh, we've been doing is actually looking at, so, uh, you know, we've, we don't have the capacity in house to run a tally analysis on every project. And so one of the efforts was to say, okay, you know, can we take a hundred square feet of facade and kind of model it, uh, put it through uh, tally and kind of look at uh, uh, the different aspects of, uh, you know, of this, you know, compa comparing basically apples to apples for across all facade types. And so on the left over here, and I, I should mention that this is module A through D in Tally. Um, and so on the left over here, uh, at the lower stand, you've got wood, wood curtain wall, wood curtain wall with uh, uh, temper tempering the glass actually adds a, a, a little bit of uh, carbon footprint to it. So one strategy to reduce your glazing um, um, carbon footprint is to actually put a mullion at 42 inches 
Um, so you can you basically need to temper gloss below 42 inches so you can have untempered gloss above it. So that is, that's a way to kind of uh, get around that. Um, aluminum curtain wall, obviously the aluminum adds to it. Um, interestingly, um, and I, I probably need to have a discussion with Alex afterwards, we got slightly different results with the, uh, with the louvers, maybe because we were using horizontal louvers. And so you have to use fewer of them. Um, uh, on pretty much almost every facade, a horizontal shade works far, far more effectively than a vertical fin. Uh, in fact, on most facades, verticals actually don't do much uh, shading. Um, and then we started to get into the opaque um, assembly. So the first thing we are uh, is this precast rain screen with XPS in the precast sandwich as insulation. And that's through the roof. And then when you look at the same system with EPS instead of XPS, that's the impact of your insulation choice on, on that facade system. So that was one uh, real takeaway for us was, uh, you know, thinking about that insulation uh, system is actually really important. Um, and then over here, that's ACT, uh, aluminum composite uh, uh, panels. Again, this, this big impact here is from the aluminum in that uh, composite panel. Um, this is a brick rain screen. Interestingly, brick actually showed up as uh, pretty much as high as concrete for us uh, on these uh, assessments. And then this is a wood rain screen with uh, mineral wool. So all, all of these guys have mineral wool as the insulation. Um, so the big takeaway there was, you know, XPS is is a is a big big factor here. Um, so the first case study I want to present uh, is. Uh, uh, wellness retreat that we are, it's currently in design development. Uh, and this is in the um, Shenandoah Valley. And it's it's a wellness retreat. It's got really high sustainability goals. Uh, we went through a, an extensive visioning session where we, we thought about, you know, various factors, um, you know, energy materials, you know, nature, giving back to the community, and then where we're sourcing our food from. And what I wanted to talk about was kind of that this is really the carbon impact there, right? So one of the goals is to have a fossil fuel free site. Um, the building is, uh, the the campus is currently uh, being designed to be 100% uh, solar with battery backup. Um, and then the um, on the material side, the goal was to actually reduce our uh, embodied carbon footprint by 50%. And it, we're still trying to figure out what that what that means in terms of like 50% reduction from what. And so the way we uh, we started to look at it was just take our, uh, what our initial kind of specs were for that, for a building like this, and then start to whittle away at that. So um, while we were doing this, uh, we, we actually went through a similar exercise and you know, one of the uh, uh, design partners was kind of, uh, Wondering, you know, because we we very often you know look at concrete as a substrate for our wall assemblies, um, and so his question was, you know, what are our alternatives to uh, to concrete? So we did this uh, um, kind of exercise where we looked at embodied carbon for a nine foot by four and a half foot wall, and the reason I picked that dimension is that actually equates to for an eight inch wall, that's a cubic yard of concrete. And so it was pretty easy to go into EC3 and look at uh, availability. So this this uh, thing over here is actually looking at what's available. Uh, so this is the highest uh, available in that region, in that Virginia region. That's the normal range. That's the lowest mix available in our region. And then that's the lowest available nationally. And that's the lowest low strength mix. So huge variability over there. So that immediately told us, well, we could probably look at realistically going that low over there. Um, interestingly, we, we, we looked at CMU, which if you, if it's ungrouted, uh, that's your range. So some of these are actually done in tally and, uh, the concrete was done in EC3. So it's probably not a kosher study because I'm not sure, um, what the boundaries for EC3. I, I suspect it's A1 through A4 for EC3 and, uh, tally kind of looks at, you know, A through D. Um, and then these are your stud walls over here, steel studs and wood studs. I should mention none of this is with insulation. This is just looking at, you know, what what are your options for the core? 
So then we started to look at the um, embodied carbon for we, we took one of the uh, six room modules for, for the uh, for the building and ran it through a tally analysis and uh, uh, I don't know if Kelsey is on this call, but uh, she's uh, an architect in our office who ran this study. And so this is that baseline over here. Um, and I should mention, we actually pulled out the A1 through A4 numbers for this uh, study. Um, so the baseline is 16 gauge uh, steel studs, 16 inches on center, fiberglass glass bats and one and a half inches XPS exterior insulation. Uh, the roof is wood framed with XPS insulation above the deck and a closed cell poly, uh, basically spray foam uh, below. And that's something that we do very often is you, you do spray foam to keep the roof profile thin. Um, but as you can see, it has a big carbon impact. And so that's something we're, we're actually look, going back and looking at our specs. Uh, the floors were wood framed with bad insulation. And then the below grade walls and slab were concrete with no cement replacement uh, with moderate re reinforcement and XPS insulation outboard. Uh, the windows were aluminum storefront with uh, double low E insulating glass. So then the next step was to say, okay, let's, let's actually switch the steel studs to two by six uh, uh, sustainably harvested timber. And so you get a little bit of bump uh, below the line over there that steel number goes down. Again, this is just looking at A1 through A4. Um, we did, we tried looking at 50% uh, cement replacement with uh, slag on the concrete, and that gave us a little bit of a, a bump over there. But again, this there's not that much concrete in this project. It's basically just the uh, below grade walls. Um, and then we looked at, you know, going switching from 5,000 PSI to uh, 3,000 PSI concrete, and that had a, a little bit of an impact. And then the last one was just, you know, it's it's the insulation. Um, so we replaced all the XPS in the walls with mineral wool, uh, replaced the XPS in the roof with poly ice. So that required a little bit of uh, redesign of where the roof membrane is, because you can't get poly ice wet. Um, and then replaced closed cell polyurethane foam with open cell foam. Uh, that uses water as a blowing agent. Um, I should mention that we could do this over here uh, because we wanted to uh, actually have a layer that's drying on both uh, on, on the inside. If you have condensation concerns, you can't do that. You got to actually incorporate a vapor barrier if you do that. It's always best practice to put all of your insulation outboard if you can. Um, but, you know, in this case, the, the, we wanted the thin roof profile. So, so we actually did have to have the, the spray foam over there. So that's kind of uh, a brief kind of look at how we walked through, kind of looking at the assemblies in this project and kind of arrived at uh, basically an, uh, you know, module A number that's pretty, pretty close to zero at this point. Now, keep in mind, this was done at schematic design. As we go through the process over here, things will add on to it. There's probably stuff that we've not uh, accounted for in some of the you know, fasteners, things like that. Uh, as we go through this, it'll flesh itself out. But this gave us enough uh, confidence to say that we, we are, we're able to hit that 50% reduction target at any rate. The second uh, uh, project I wanted to talk about, and this is where that I'm, I'm sure there'll be a little bit of controversy here because uh, um, I'm looking at aluminum fins on an exterior facade on a curtain wall assembly for this project. So this is a, a project that's actually under construction now, and it's the 760 Ralph McGill Boulevard uh, project in Atlanta. And um, it's it's a million square foot mixed use office building, spec office building, um, and uh, with retail on the ground floor and uh, 14 stories of office above it. and. Part of the goal here was to actually uh, kind of develop a system where we can, uh, you know, the, the I lived in Atlanta for about 10 or 11 years. And, you know, living there, you, it's actually interesting because people assume you're going to be air conditioned all the time, but it's actually kind of pleasant for a lot of the year to actually sit in like a shaded porch. You think of the screen porch idea. And so the, the goal here was to actually challenge the notion of, it's always air conditioned. Can we develop spaces where people can actually um, 
have that that ability to to occupy kind of porch tap spaces and so um to control that you know that you you kind of when we think of thermal comfort we always think of air temperature it's actually uh, a combination of six factors there's uh, uh air temperature but there's also mean radiant temperature humidity and airflow and then the last two are uh, clothing levels and met metabolic rate which we often don't control um but these these we do control and so the the idea is you know could you use ceiling fans could you use uh air movement but then key to that is actually controlling the sun um you know one thing we we tried to do was actually reduce the amount of glass on this but you know with a spec office building sometimes your hands are tied with that it's it's just you 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 doubt uh, uh, sometimes you dealt dealt a hand that you can't you can't control some of these aspects uh so the goal was to say okay you know can we can we actually maximize this can we actually develop a system where uh a you deliver thermal comfort so your mean rating temperature is not too high and then um you actually develop uh, uh deliver uh, daylight comfort visual comfort as well so we actually did a, a um, extensive modeling on the facades we actually looked at vertical fins um horizontal we looked at a scrim pattern what we ended up with was a, a, a louver uh, placement so these are um i think it was 11 inch louvers about a uh, foot and a half apart and this was looking at it on each of the orientations so southwest southeast northeast and northwest and we looked at uh, so on these facades there was a reduction of uh, you know Pretty much on uh, all of these close to 50% in of a peak load reduction. So that's a reduction in the HVAC systems, all of the ducting, piping, all of that stuff. Um, and then there was a, a reduction on the south sides of about 50%, 60% of a year on um, uh, the cumulative radiation during the cooling period. So that translates into energy and comfort. Um, on the north uh, west, which is actually predominant predominantly a north facade um the numbers were low enough that we we chose not to put the fence over there so the the goal was to uh, we were given a budget of 70 percent of the facade we can cover with fins and so we used this analysis to see where we needed them most and put them where, where we needed them um incidentally we also did an analysis looking at uh, interior shade deployment probability and so this is actually looking at when will the shades be deployed uh, based on glare potential. And so this is the um, bare facade with no shades on the west and south facades, 50%, 40%. So, and when it gets that high, uh, it's almost always going to be done. So th this is interior blinds. Um, when you get to, you know, above 40%, uh, what we find is, you know, they go down and they stay down because it's too much of an effort to keep moving them up and down. So what we found is by by adding those uh, the shades over here, uh, we were actually able to reduce the uh, uh, the numbers down to about um, eight percent over here, six percent over here. On the north, it was it was ten percent to start off with, so we we decided not to go, not to go with the shades on that facade. Um, so that's that's kind of the 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 intent here is to you know that's your baseline. Um, Ironically, having those louvers there actually improves your view because you can kind of see through them and it gives you more uh, thermal comfort. So you can put people up against the facade without without having uh, potential huge thermal comfort issues. And then we actually ran um, extensive uh, uh, daylight modeling. There's a three, uh, sorry, energy modeling. There's a 3% energy reduction uh, from the shades if you just run it. Uh, run the models the way you know we normally run our energy models if you take into account mean radiant temperature and the fact that thermostats will actually be set down lower when your mean radiant temperature goes higher there's actually a five percent reduction um and if that this is assuming a, a, a intelligent uh variable thermostat if you use a thermostat that uh, most people use in office buildings today that's that number actually looks more like eight to ten percent reduction uh, for this climate so when we were doing this analysis uh, the uh, uh, 
Tom Kunde, who's the design director on the project, uh, raised the question that's all very well, but what about the embodied carbon of the louvers? Is it worth it? Um, and so we, we actually ran a family analysis on it. Um, and so, um, so this is kind of what, what it looks like. So, and this is a concrete building, Atlanta is a concrete town. Um, and so the embodied uh, carbon is really dominated by the concrete uh, slabs, beams, and columns. That's your podium facade. That's your curtain wall um, with the glass and everything. That's the, the other walls in the building. Uh, there's another others category, which is pretty small over here. That's the um, embodied carbon of your louvers attached on the outside. And Atlanta is uh, in the Southern Company energy grid, which is, I think it's uh, 90 plus percent uh, of the energy comes from coal-fired power plants. And so that's, uh, so we, we modeled it with an energy use of uh, EUI 50, which is what you would expect for a code compliant office building in that area. And that's the embody, that's the operational carbon for the uh, electrical energy use for one year. That's the energy saved from the louvers, 5%. So when you look at that in comparison, um, we estimated that the payback for those louvers was about a two and a half year payback. So in our uh, estimate over there, it was worth it. It was, uh, you know, it, it saved enough energy that enough carbon, I should say, that at the end of that uh, two and a half years, it would have fulfilled its carbon debt. Um, I should throw in a caveat that we are probably not as experienced as Alex and Ifri at modeling embodied carbon. So I would love to check our numbers with you, Alex, and uh, make sure that, you know, that actually does look okay. Um, but it kind of... Uh, brings this idea of, you know, it's always a, you, we got to think about this both in terms of embodied, but also operational carbon and think about it in terms of a life, uh, uh, timeline. So when you, when you think about that, you know, you've got time on the X axis and then carbon on the Y axis. So typically you have this, you know, embodied carbon at the start of the project. Um, and then you add operational carbon to it, which increases every year. If you build a net zero energy slash carbon building, that's what it looks like. And to really get to carbon neutral, you gotta you gotta dig down, right? You gotta find ways to offset that. And so, you know, if you're able to do that at some point, you get carbon neutral and then you get climate positive. Um, what I wanna kind of think about is, you know, when you think about embodied carbon, there's, you know, the different modules. So there's A, B, and C. And I think it's really important to think about, you know, if you think about end of life, um, you know, you, what you're really starting off with is module A. And so that point of carbon neutrality is actually not, if you factor everything, that C comes in at the end of life, right? And we can actually impact that by thinking about all that. But the point I want to make here is that, you know, if we think about the urgency of this and where, uh, you know, that we need to kind of hit these goals sooner, then I don't know, in my opinion, it's kind of important to think about actually attacking that module A number more, um, I guess, with more vigor and kind of trying to move that point of carbon neutrality, move that timeline up. And then, I mean, you're still gonna have that, you know, that end of life impact, um, but actually thinking about, you know, doing this first, I think is really important. So that's that's my brief presentation. Uh, you know, uh, lots of caveats thrown in there, but, uh, you know, thanks for your attention. Oh, wait, uh, there's another thing I wanted to point out. So this is actually a tool we've been kind of looking at. So the, the other thing to keep in mind, so that Atlanta project, if we had built it in Seattle, would have looked very different. So we actually built a little dashboard tool over here that allows us to take a project through um, these various stages. You know, you can look at, well, if you build it in concrete, steel, you can put in your own LCA numbers over here. This is what we, what we had for that Atlanta project. 
And then you can start to, um, you can play around with the timeline. So, you know, let's say it's 20 years instead of 30 years. What does that look like? And so uh, you, you kind of have your, uh, you can start to say, okay, you know, I need to read, I want to reduce my cooling by, you know, X amount. And as you go through this, it actually gives you some design suggestions to, to hit those targets. And you notice as it gets harder, the colors change. Uh, and if you go beyond the point, it actually says, you know, this might not be feasible and it turns bright orange and uh, things. So, so you, it kind of shows you how to get there, what the biggest slices of the pie are. Um, and then you can add solar to it, uh, photovoltaics uh, to say, okay, you know, how much of my roof do I need to cover? And it's a little too small, so you can't see that number. Um, so that gets you to net zero, and then you can say, okay, you know, how much additional solar do I need to get to to that carbon neutral uh, perspective? So, so this is a, uh, something that we've been developing in house. It's a little rudimentary. It's Excel based, uh, but it can be an effective tool to kind of uh, think about these decisions early on in the project. So, with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over. Thank you, Vikram. That was great. Um, I especially liked the the, the um, animation at the end, uh, looking at how to move it forward. It was a nice way to kind of end the presentations. Um, uh, we do have some questions in the chat, and we have about seven minutes left. But um, if it's okay with the presenters, we can stay on a little bit longer just to capture the results. Otherwise, um, let's get let's dive in so we can make the most of the time. And I saw Alex, you already responded to one of the questions. So I'm going to skip that and then go to um, Georgiana has a question for Alex for case study one. Um, and her question is, was there a clear takeaway that metal outperformed uh, cement and uh, for the better? And what type of metal was there? Yeah, we were looking at corrugated steel. Okay. Uh, Georgiana, feel free to like unmute if you had anything else to add to that, um, or does that answer your question? Sorry about that. Yeah, um, that answers the question for sure. Um, but obviously, there are pretty large differences between the types of metal used and the backing systems for those. So it'd be really interesting to see a breakdown of all of those. I suppose we could run the tally as well. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. All right. So Webley has a question again for Alex. For either case studies that you presented, did the team study or consider modular design options for the facade with the intent of reducing material waste? You know, in this, in, in the case of these two case studies, I don't think so. I don't, but I'm also like, I, I'd like to hear more Webley, like what do you mean by modular? Is it like a whole tile of a facade that comes pre-made and then you plug it in? Because isn't, I guess like, isn't every facade kind of modular? <laughs> so what what is the level of modularity that um, you're looking for? Well, should that mean modular versus stick built? Or maybe prefab? Did you mean like a prefab construction where everything is done in, uh, yeah, yeah. is Webley uh, still on? I think we might have lost Webley. But you know, that's a really good point about prefabrication. Uh, these case studies didn't focus on this, but this is an important question to answer, especially when it comes to facades. Um, one interesting thing with prefabrication is that if we go back to kind of eFreak's conceptualization of each life cycle stage, when you prefabricate, really, you're just offsetting emissions that would happen during A5 at the construction stage of actually assembling the thing on site. And all of the LCA studies that I shared with you today don't include that stage. We don't have, or I don't have enough data to describe what actually happens during A5 with the buildings that we build. So I guess I think one challenge that we will have with quantifying the value of prefabrication in terms of embodied carbon is we'll need to have good A5 data from our con contractor partners to really know what we are offsetting. 
Awesome. If you, was there anything you wanted to add to that or? All right. I mean, I think the only thing I would add to that is that there are some benefits in terms of um, prefab potentially uh, in terms of recoverability and waste factors and ability to um, make much, much higher tolerance, like, or rather much lower tolerances um, so that you don't have as much on-site waste factor uh, that you'd be dealing with. But, um, yeah, and then also, you know, A4, which is typically not included, uh, you can have a lot of savings in terms of like crane energy and um, all that type of work that would need to happen. Um, but it'd be great to see a data set that includes that and can show that. Awesome. Um, and we have one more question from Jack Rusk. Um, and his question is, I think for Vikram, with the LCA for specific assemblies, he's saying one of the issues he's run into is making sure that all the options have a reasonably similar function unit so that you can actually do an apples to apples comparison. So he's asking what criteria and constraints are you um, functional units? Yeah, uh, what uh, criteria and constraints are you applying when making these comparisons? Are you using air tightness, R value, oh, thickness gosh. of assembly? So like I said, this this is a, it's in infancy. And so it's, it's, in, it's a really good question because, you know, you can look at the, you know, that hundred square foot exercise that we did and you're looking at curtain wall and, you know, all these other things. The, in terms of energy performance, the opaque wall is probably going to outperform the curtain wall, regardless, even with the shaded thing. Uh, but you also got to think about the value judgment in terms of, you know, we don't want to live in, you know, black boxes, right? We, we want that connection to the outside. So it's a question of how much and how do we, how do we right size it? Um, in terms of air tightness and all those, the, that's really... That's that's a factor of how you detail it. Um, you know, typically with a curtain wall assembly, you're probably more likely to get a really good airtight assembly versus, uh, um, you know, that's one thing with the punched opening system. Uh, you basically got a thermal bridge at every cell, every jam uh, condition, and you've got potentials for for air leakage. So there's there's a plus and minus, but you, and it's each of these systems, you gotta uh, you gotta look at as uh, at a case by case basis and do uh, kind of a holistic analysis on, on all of that and think about you know I think I think it also starts out with you know where in the country are you because yeah I mean eventually hopefully all grids turn into you know carbon neutral electricity produ production that's not happening in you know in a near term, right? Um, the the southeastern grid is not going to turn carbon neutral overnight. I I worked for you know ten years as the chair of the Georgia Solar Energy Association, trying to get that to change. It's it's a it's a big boat to turn around. So that's where it kind of helps to prioritize. You know, if you build the same thing in Seattle, we our electricity is pretty much carbon neutral. So embodied carbon has a much, much huger impact versus if you if you go a couple of states over, it's not the case. So that has an impact on your decision-making process as well uh, in terms of, um, you know, is energy the most important thing? Is embodied carbon the most important thing? What's the, uh, uh, yeah. So, sorry, I, I hope that kind of answered your question. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself, Jack, um, if yeah. that didn't, or if it did. No, thank you. I appreciate those points. I think the functional unit question is a little different, though. It's how you make sure that the assemblies you're looking at, like you're making sure that they play a similar role in the building. Um, just like kind of an LCA nerd question, I guess, to, as, as we like try not to do whole building LCAs to answer every question, but do these kind of tactical ones. Um, just trying to figure out the best kind of conditions to make sure we're making those comparisons responsibly. Something I struggle with, like setting those up. Um, so just a point of curiosity, but thank you for your comments. 
Yeah. On, Thank you. Just to that note, um, typically what we'll do in our office is maintain our value because that's a really obvious one. Yep. Um, but then essentially use the detail um, or the you know section through the envelope um, frequently from another project. So it's basically like, this is how we would build it if this is what we're doing, um, which doesn't mean that we necessarily maintain air tightness um, and some of the other things that might operate impact uh, operational carbon. Um, but uh, assuming that our value is uh, the primary driver of the energy model um, and that we're hopefully getting close to the same level of air tightness across assemblies. Um, so um, that's typically our approach on that front. If, if I might add something to that, I, I found that it's actually more useful, more effective to look at U value rather than R value. So then you're looking at the entire assembly of factory and thermal bridges and brakes and all of that. And then where you put the insulation also matters, especially if you, as you get into colder climates, um, you got to think about condensation and where that happens in the facade. Because ultimately the worst thing you can do for your facade is to have it fail and have to be replaced. Um, so you want to, you know, the first thing you want to be able to do is to build a long lived facade. That's a, that's a really great point to um, make here because uh, a lot of this is, um, uh, a lot of these topics are what we're going to um, explore in our workshop next month, where we're going to actually try to do um, breakout groups with uh, attendees and actually calculate different wall assemblies and looking at the U value, thermal break and all of that. So I hope um, for whoever is still on, you're able to join us um, next uh, next month when we do our workshop related to this um, topic. Um, I do. I'm going to pass the the mic over because I think that's the last of our questions uh, to Danielle, since we have a newly emerging Carbon Leadership Forum uh, chapter here in Philly. She has a couple of slides that she wants her to share about that, and then. Yep. Thanks, Shanti. Um, as you said, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce CLF Philly. Uh, as you can see here, their mission is to raise awareness, provide education, build community around the topic of embodied carbon. Um, I can find myself. There you go. Um, and so CLF Philly was actually launched last year, last summer, uh, but they're working with GBU to become a community and be more engaged with um, uh, sustainable communities within uh, the greater Philadelphia area. So you have the CEOs and the founders here. Um, they met and decided to create a local hub in Philadelphia, which is really exciting. So you have Esther Abano, the Director of Global Building Network and is an Associate Professor at Penn State. Lisa Conway is a VP of Sustainability at Interface um, and co-founder of Materials Can. And then we have Cecilia Freeman, who's an interior designer at Jacobs. And so they regularly collaborate with the sustainable built environment community, like I said, specifically on embodied carbon. And we're looking forward to collaborating with that coat is looking forward to collaborating with them on this topic as well um, through education initiatives, news and outreach. And we're also working with them to advocate for regulations and legislation in Philadelphia related to embodied carbon. Um, so I highly recommend learning more about CLF and I wanna reiterate um, that there are tons of resources that they make available on embodied carbon. Um, in their online community, there's a forum. They also have uh, some guidance on like building owners and leases, policy guidance, and a number of the tools that were mentioned during the sessions today are also um, available on their site. So there's some contact information, feel free to reach out to them directly or reach out to us if you're interested in learning more and being a part of our collaboration with them. Um, and then I'll just close with a little summary about upcoming events with COAT. Um, thank you for attending this 2030 Working Group um, event. If you're interested in being more involved or learning about our other four subcommittees, we meet regularly. Um, we have a monthly meeting on the third Thursday of each month at 8 a.m. So the upcoming one is on July 21st at 8. And we'll be hosting Spec Matters to talk about empowering the industry to build healthier environments. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter or Google Calendar or keep uh, in order to keep up to date with our events. So I'll drop some links in the chat, but here's a QR code on the left for our newsletter. And then one more time on the right for the AIA credits in case you didn't fill out the forms that were in the chat. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
Thank you to our presenters for joining us uh, early in the morning, your time, and thank you for everyone here locally in Philadelphia for joining us during your lunch hour. Um, and we hope to see you next month um, when we do our workshop. Thanks, thank everyone.